Yeah. yeah. Back again. All right. We're over 100 now. I know. It's pretty We're cool, man. Fucking coasting. Every time, every Wednesday when those are released, it's mm-hmm. like, just keep stacking them. Keep listening, sports fans. Yeah, seriously, keep listening and subscribe to our YouTube page. Hi, everybody. I'm Dom DiTola with the Sports Experience Podcast, sitting alongside co-host Chris Quinn. How you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? Good, man. Just yeah. uh, back into some uh, football action. Today. I know. We got a, a definitely a good one. I, I knew a little bit about Bobby Mitchell, who we're talking about today, but I definitely didn't know all of the stuff that he went through. So, uh, yeah, this was definitely a good one. Yeah, we... Uh, tend to look as you've noticed if you've been listening to our episodes we do episodes on guys who are overlooked a little bit yeah and guys that you know maybe don't make any sort of list of like most important athletes but they are very important oh for absolutely various reasons and bobby mitchell was definitely very important definitely people that, that should be remembered for things that they do within their career so yeah yeah and the shit that this guy had to put up with no oh, it's ridiculous and it's not even his fault and like he just took it in stride yeah like a goddamn champion but uh bobby mitchell born june 6 1935 in uh hot springs arkansas i believe yep hot springs arkansas um he went to uh langston high and like almost everybody that we talk about especially from this era of these guys playing all sports he was literally good at every sport that you could play not specializing in one thing just going out and dominating in football basketball track and field he also was scouted by the st louis cardinals well he was so good at baseball they were asking him to forego college and Mm -hmm. come to their minor minor league system and Pretty much become a baseball player. Which would have been very interesting. I know, I know. Very interesting. But he said no. Went to college to play football, and this was the thing that I found so interesting was he excelled so much at track that it constantly got people questioning whether he was going to do these other sports. Well, as you'll see, by 1960, he has a very difficult decision to make regarding uh, the Olympic team. Exactly. Training for the uh, running events. Yeah, yeah. But uh, goes to the University of Illinois. Obviously can't play as a freshman because, well, you're not getting paid and you can't play. That's just crackerjack. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just, uh, <laughs> you know, getting uh, stuck right in the eye. But uh, 1955, the sophomore season, he has kind of a breakout year for the fighting Illini. Well, this kind of happens sometimes, especially with sophomore running backs or sophomore players, is the guy in front of you gets injured. So and I think they were yeah. seven, eight games into the into the season. Harry Jefferson got hurt. And Harry Jefferson gets hurt. and they, they One s- of the games. They sub Bobby Mitchell in, and I think it's the first touch he gets on the ball, right? Yeah, he scored a rushing touchdown. Yeah, 68 yards. 68, yeah, it's ridiculous. Just, and Bobby Mitchell, good sized back, even for today's era, about six foot, 200 pounds, but very speedy. Yes. And uh, has a great game, and uh, they upset number three Michigan 25 to 6. Yeah. And, and it's great. I was going to say, and it shows right away that Bobby Mitchell can play this like outstanding huge play running back not just like a three four yarder well he's a home run hitter yes what he is and we'll see in the nfl when some changes occur for him uh how he continues to excel doing that but uh, the following season he's kind of hampered by injuries yeah he has a knee injury that i mean pretty much takes him out of the whole season which Thank God, considering how barbaric surgery was during those days, it's like Oregon Trail style. Oh, my God. Yeah. (laughs) Well, what we're going to do here is get the (laughs) saw. Yeah. It's like a Civil War battlefield at some of these colleges, probably. But anyway, uh, 1957 uh, has a hell of a season um, for them. He had uh, almost 500 rushing yards, um, one catch or uh, four catches for a touchdown and uh, plays in the all star game against the Detroit Lions because back in those days, um, the college all-star team would play the championship-winning team from the previous season in the NFL. And he had has a, a hell of an impression in that game. I was going to say, he has a really great game against pros. I feel like this could have been a good you know, size up for a lot of these guys. Like, could they come and play in the NFL? And this was showed that Bobby Mitchell, he was just like, no, I can play against the lions. And this is how long ago this was. The team that they played was the Detroit lions. I was yes. like, this is a, uh, this is a Bobby Lane's team. Exactly. No, it would have been Tobin road at that point. Yeah. But, uh, 
he comes out, uh, or I should add, mention about his track. Career, I was going to say, let's talk yeah, track, let's track it, yeah, because how uh, good he was. He definitely he won a Big Ten championship with Illinois. He scored most of his team's points. I was going to say, <laughs> scored the majority of their points in this track and field yeah. event to win this championship. And a lot of people thought he was going to make track and field his livelihood. They didn't think he was going to go into football or baseball. Obviously, baseball was kind of done at this yeah, point. Yeah, that's kind of out the window. Um, but they didn't think football was his priority, essentially. Yeah, and you see that even into the future, probably up through the 80s with yep. a lot of guys. They don't kind of know which sport to end up picking. But uh, does a hell of a job at Illinois. And then when it comes into the 1958 draft, he drops a little bit. Well, that's why it said that Paul Brown was able yeah. to go get him in the seventh round was exactly. everybody did. They couldn't count on his commitment, which was kind of crazy to think about. Um, and they said that Paul Brown offered him $7,000 to come to the Browns. We're going to say Browns and Brown a lot here. Yeah. Um, to play essentially a halfback for him. Yeah, because in 1958, they already have arguably the greatest running back of all time on their team, Jim Brown. Yep. Who's playing fullback. You need a speedster halfback next to him who Hold can on. excel in the passing game. Jim Brown played football. I thought he was a lacrosse player. See... <laughs> He was a lacrosse player. He was also in the 1996 thriller Mars Attacks, if you've never Beautiful. seen that. Beautiful. Jim Brown, that's Working right. at Vegas. Uh, Caesars. Hot on-scene uh, kiss with Raquel Welch in his acting career. You go, Jim Brown. Yeah, but without a doubt, top three running back, and a lot of people will put him at number one. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so. usually interchangeable. It's Walter Payton and him. Yeah. And pick him at that point. But you add Bobby Mitchell to this offense, and he's an exciting player for them. He's great, even as a rookie. And he's a different kind of running back yeah. than Jim Brown is, which was why, and we were talking about it pre-podcast, um, which is why this made like one of, if not the best backfield ever, because they were just like, are you going to, is Jim Brown going to just come right through you? Or is Bobby Mitchell going to bounce it to the outside and he's going to run right past you? It was definitely... And it's crazy to say because the Browns have been so bad, but they were so lethal in, in that backfield. Yeah, I mean, who who's going to get the ball? Yeah. They had a great team, I mean, at that uh, time, and they were consistent winners. Um, 1958, uh, Mitchell's rookie year, um, 131 carries. Um, no, pardon me, that's 1959. He had 500 yards rushing on 80 carries and a touchdown, 16 catches for 131 yards and three touchdowns. And started seven of the 12 games. Yeah. That was the only time they made the playoffs when they played together, which is so fascinating. They lost uh, the divisional game to the uh, Giants 10-0. to zero. And uh, you're thinking, oh, okay, well, this is a setback. And uh, it kind of opens up 1959 where he really establishes himself. Well, I want to talk about this in his uh, rookie season. He had 232 uh, yards in a game. Yeah, let's talk about Yeah, okay. Um, and Jim Brown had the record at that point of 237 yards, and he had this 232 yards right around the middle of the third quarter. <laughs> and he he said he was just playing he didn't even know. Like he didn't he wasn't like counting his yards. He didn't know what the record was. And Paul Brown actually took him out and said, uh, we're going to save you for next week, kid. And he goes, like, I made the realization later that he was just like, oh, he's saving this record for, for Jim Brown. And he said that Paul Brown used him a lot to motivate. Oh, yeah. No, like, that's to get the best out of Jim Brown. Be like, well, we have this guy who can also be very good. Exactly. And he was just like, I didn't realize Jim Brown needed to be motivated. But there was, like, some times where I would go out and have a kickoff return for, like, 60 yards. Yeah, or you'd have a touchdown. Yeah. And, and, and Jim Brown would be like, I was supposed to get the ball there. And it's such a... It's such a great thing to have in a football team where you have that competition where guys aren't even necessarily on the same position, but kind of are. And, you well, know, even today, Jim Brown speaks so highly of Bobby Mitchell. He's like one of his best friends oh, on yeah. the team. And Mitchell always credits him for kind of taking him under his wing. Like there's a mutual respect there yep. with the competition, which you don't see too much in sports no. anymore. Yeah, no, they definitely had that respect for each other. And Jim Brown said that he's one of the most underrated players not just running backs ever in the nfl which are you like, one of the most versatile backs like really 
you see guys like Marshall Falk and Christian McCaffrey, to me, that's where it started with Bobby Mitchell, that type of running back. Well, we see that skills. later in his career. Yeah. He, I mean, we're going to get into it. You know how it. we do here. But uh, 1959 starts all 12 games, uh, 131 carries, 743 yards, five touchdowns, 35 catches for 351 yards. So now you're seeing him really start to become the threat in the passing game for uh, Cleveland, four touchdowns. So, I mean – they have a winning record. They just don't make the playoffs under the current structure. Yeah. Which is kind of rough if you think about it because it's like this might be the last time they're good for a while. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's why when they change the structure, it really helps out because you have these teams who are good, but they just don't have that great record. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 1960, uh, 111 carries, 506 yards, five touchdowns, 45 catches, 612 yards, and a TD pass along with six touchdowns. So, I mean, he's really doing an incredible job for them, and they're just not quite getting over the hump, yet you have the league's most lethal backfield. Yep. So, it's a damn shame, Cleveland. And then in his final season, 1961, 101 carries, 548 yards, five touchdowns, 32 catches, 368 yards, and three touchdowns, and he makes the Pro Bowl. Yeah, first Pro Bowl. Yeah, um, which, amazing. And he still holds the record uh, for the Browns for a rookie running back for uh, average carries. I think it's 6.3. Yards per carry, yeah. yeah. And 6.3 yards a carry in those days is ridiculous, oh, considering it's... how there's no passing game yeah. to offset it. and. That's, 6.3 is amazing now. And that's what is so great was he was this big-time play guy when big-time play guys almost just, like, didn't exist. Well, the amazing thing is he was not only good as a receiver, he was not only good as a rusher, he was an incredible kick and punt returner. Yep. And he proved this throughout his career. Three kickoffs and three punt returns for touchdowns in his four years with the Browns. And amazing stats. And you would figure that a guy who had – over 20 almost 2300 rush yards almost 1500 receiving yards and is a threat to score at any point 38 total touchdowns you would think this guy is a cornerstone for the future of this franchise along with jim brown but it doesn't happen well he said that paul brown just did not like him paul brown didn't like a lot of people and it, that's kind of <laughs> what he said was he didn't he felt like he was undervalued or not being valued so he kind of they just kind of moved him and this is where we get into the interesting part of it, of the trade, if you will. Yeah, these are shenanigans that are not cheeky and fun, but no. tragic and cruel, which doesn't Evil really make shenanigans. shenanigans at all. <laughs> Cap, you know I'm not a pro-union guy. <laughs> but uh, so heading into the 1962 season, the Washington, whatever they are now, have the first pick in the NFL draft. And the they're under pressure to integrate. Yes. They're the last team to not integrate. Even the Red Sox have integrated by this point. Get your shit together, Redskins or Washington. Oh, fuck it. I'll just say Redskins. It yeah. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. They're the Redskins then. So exactly. It's fine. Yeah. Um, their owner, George Preston Marshall. You know how we talk about men of their time? Oh, my God. Where you're just like, okay, well, that guy's from that era, whatever. This guy was a man of his time in probably the 1830s, not the 1960s. Yeah, no, he was ridiculous. And there were some stories that I heard coming out when he signed that. Pretty yeah. horrifying. Um, with the first pick, though, they end up pay, uh, taking Ernie Davis. So, yes, what happens is a uh, trade is executed between Cleveland and Washington because Washington has the number one pick. And to integrate their team... Cleveland sends Bobby Mitchell to Washington. Cleveland is also intrigued because they have the first pick to select Ernie Davis from Syracuse, who is supposed to be the next Jim Brown. Yep. Just won a Heisman Trophy. You know, sky's the limit for this guy. So everyone's like, oh, this is an even trade. Washington integrates with one of the best running backs in the league. Cleveland gets a nice story and a successor to Jim Brown in the process doesn't happen no not for Cle i would say this is where a cleveland sports curse starts honestly well it's it's something that wouldn't happen today because they test these guys so much but unfortunately er, um, ernie davis actually has leukemia while this is all happening doesn't and know it he actually never plays a single down in the nfl so i mean it's just one of those horrible horrible situations 
And the Redskins and Marshall get very lucky because they get Bobby Mitchell. Bobby Mitchell, not so lucky for all of the racism and horrible things that he has to endure. So let's talk about he signs with them, goes to the goes to Washington. He says, we come out as a team and there's like a bunch of boosters and people and like he goes, I thought we were going to like sing the national anthem or something. And everybody just starts belting and he goes. At the top of their, like, they're, like, yelling this yeah. shit. They just start singing, Welcome to Dixie, or whatever that racist song is. Um, oh, the Hail to the Redskins yeah. fight for old no, Dixie. No. Oh, no, like so, the actual Dixie song? Yes, oh, and Jesus then they Captain sang Tim the Christ. and then they sang the Hail to the Redskins, and they were talking, he was talking about it, he was just like, I don't know these, you know, ridiculous songs, but he was talking about how, at the time, he didn't really think much of it. Yeah, I mean, he just wants to play football. Exactly. Like, And that's, Jim Brown had talked about that. He's just like, the guy took it in stride. He was like the most unnecessary victim ever, but he handled it like a goddamn champion. But um, yeah, 1962, he comes to the Redskins. Um, If you didn't, I mean, if you do remember in our NFL AFL podcast, we had talked about how the Redskins up until the creation of the AFL were the South's team. Yeah. So that's you know, why you see this. They were like the redneck team. Yeah. That's why, you know, they were pissed about Dallas trying to enter the yes. AFL. They were pissed about the Cowboys even existing. They, and then you also have uh, new Orleans and uh, Atlanta coming into the league later that decade. So, uh, walks into a bad situation the redskins are not good at this point which is kind of what happens when you only let whites play on a sports team i mean i'm just saying like not really a good strategy you need a variety you need a diversity come on it doesn't need to be a benetton ad but jesus get some black people on your team (laughs) well it's just that's what was ridiculous was literally the u.s federal government told the yeah. Washington Redskins, you need to integrate. This is ridiculous. And to think that, that it came to that point, maybe they should have changed their name. That's well, all I'm saying. Like the Redskins were good in like the 30s and kind of early yeah. 40s. And then once the league was integrated, they just bottomed the fuck out as a franchise. Um, but night back to 1962. Yep. First game ever makes a great impression. Well, let me say this. So he goes to the Redskins. The coach is uh, Bill McPeak, yeah. I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and Bill says, hey, man, we got a good quarterback, but we don't have a good offensive line. I want to put you on the outside and essentially just dump the ball to you. Yeah. And, what the, and I wanted to ask you what the name of it was, like a flanker. Okay, so flanker, basically what you do um, strategically as an offense is if you run a two-wide receiver set, one of the receivers lines up on the line of scrimmage. That guy is the split end. Your other guy who has to line up slightly off the line of scrimmage, he's the guy that can go in motion oh, and okay. do everything because the tight end is covering him up. I get you. Because the split end on the outside covers up the tackle without the tight end because you need, um, I think, seven guys on the uh, line of scrimmage. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you're, yeah, seven guys on the line of scrimmage. So the flanker, what um, is different from the split end is usually you want a smaller player there, a shiftier player, a faster player. Guys you can give end arounds to, run wide receiver screens, tunnel screens, that type of shit. Guys that can operate in space really well, which is Bobby Mitchell. Fucking brilliant on the Bill McPeak's part. I mean, but also for Bobby Mitchell to be like, I've been playing running back for so long. Granted, I'm a great pass receiver, but I don't line up on the line of scrimmage. I line up in the backfield. So, yeah, they move the flanker, and it's a perfect fit. I was going to say, he's a great football player, and I feel like this is kind of that era where they like they can see it and they they're like, well, you're, you know, you could be a good running back here mm-hmm. or a great flanker, and that's exactly what he was. And first game against the Cowboys, yep, ninety-two yard kickoff return for a touchdown, made the Pro Bowl that year, even though the team finished five seven and two, which was an improvement. That's that's how you know how rough it was yeah. for these white guys. <laughs> but he led the league with seventy nine catches. 1,384 yards, and then also had 11 touchdown catches. Yeah. That's his first season As switching a, to a new position in the NFL. This isn't high school. This isn't college. Yeah. This is the NFL. Like, And he goes out and is amazing. Like Some of the catches he makes are just 
incredible. Mm -hmm. Just incredible. And he's the perfect size to play the position. He has all the attributes. It's kind of interesting to see like why nobody ever wanted him to do it before like earlier in his career. Yeah, well why didn't they do that at the Browns kind of thing? But that's I mean, you kind of see that Paul Brown just didn't like him and you you think was he just trying to fit him in his system and he didn't necessarily necessarily use him to his best abilities. Yeah, he was probably just like, "Oh, this guy's fast and shifty. He'll be the lightning to Jim Brown's thunder." Yep. So, I probably what went through his head and I think they had some decent receivers at that point, so So, yeah. And you just expound the running game even more with his presence but 1963 is just as productive pro bowl all pro um 1436 yards receiving leading the league 69 catches seven touchdowns and also had a 99 yard touchdown catch that yeah. year which is pretty awesome yeah now that's i mean come on now but yeah just had a really productive spell at the at the redskins i saw yeah, 1964, same thing. 60 catches, 904 yards, 10 touchdowns. I mean, what the the best part is, um, uh, their wide receiving core at this point is really good. Yeah. They have Charlie Taylor, Jerry Smith playing tight end. I mean, they're a great offense during this era for Washington. Their defense is just straight ass, though. Like, they're not any good, and that's what's making them like a 500 team, despite being one of the most exciting offenses in the league. Well, what I saw, what he was talking about, how hard it was to integrate into Washington and be that first black player was he had to pretty much watch everything he did because he was getting vilified by both white and black yeah. community. And what he said, he was just like, thank God that I had this steady career for like six or seven years. Oh, his prime was great. It, 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 he was like, it cemented me because the black community was like, here's our hero and he's producing. And the white community, he said, was like, fuck this guy. Oh, wait, we love the Redskins. Oh, wait, he's the best player on our team. <laughs> exactly. And that's what, it, especially for this era in this super yeah. racist fan base, they just like, he really changed essentially Washington Redskins football. Yeah, he made them competitive and not a laughing stock. Yep. You know, even though they were like, oh, well, here's our token black player. But it's like, oh, no, he's really good. Yes. <laughs> like, well, I mean, without a doubt, one of the best in the league. And that's the, we come back to Jim Brown talking about how good he is. When one of the best players ever is like, this guy's good. That's when I'm like, oh, shit, we need to look at that guy. Exactly. Um, 65 and 60, 66, yep. just still as productive. 60 catches, 867 and 6 TDs. And then 58 catches for 900. 105 yards and nine TDs. Yeah. He also uh, uh, moved back, or uh, he also had 13 carries for 141 yards and a touchdown that season. So, so they start kind of, to move him around to running back and giving him sw ends or end arounds and yep. sweeps and shit, which makes sense because that's what is required out of that position. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a game in 1966. Um, November 27th, they played the Giants. Um, NFL Films calls it the, like the day that rained footballs. They scored 72 points and won. <laughs> wow. It was 72 to 41. Just the passing game in that, in that um, particular game was amazing. That's crazy, especially for the era. Oh, yeah, totally. That's what you, you always have to bring up. Well, they were operating on another fucking level. It's like, oh, you have Charlie Taylor, Jerry Smith, and Bobby Mitchell. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, and our defense is terrible, giving up over 40 points, so we need as many as we can possibly so, get. Oh, we're getting the ball back right now? All right. It's been like a minute and a half. Screw it. Let's go. Thanks. You're ruining it for the rest of us, dicks. <laughs> but in 67 is kind of when you see things tail off a bit because they have a new head coach, um, someone he uh paul brown knew from his days in cleveland otto graham yep and otto has the fantastic idea of moving him to running back okay so again. this is when they straight up say you're going back to running back we're not going to have you as this dump passer yeah exactly i mean he made play tons of plays down the field but yes like that but his said, his main position role in the team was going to now be running back again which is interesting considering how productive that he was that's what i thought it, it's such a weird thing to see this guy really excelling and then be like yeah but you remember when you were on the browns and yeah. i was coaching back then like assistant and you're it's just like 
no come on man like it's like no stick with what got you there yeah but uh even when he's moved back to running back 60 catches 866 yards and six touchdowns like it's not like you he's know, not pro- he's not like he's not productive yeah. any one of these seasons Six, he had 61 carries and a touchdown that year but it's like you know where your bread and butter is right yeah. now at this juncture and then uh 68 is starting when it kind of starts to wear down because he's already in your what freaking uh 10 of yeah. his career so 10 11 so 14 catches 130 yards no touchdowns the entire season um for bobby mitchell um 1969 though was an interesting year for washington because they finally have a legitimate head coach well this is when essentially like and it's interesting for the rest of his career because vince lombardi comes in yeah vince lombardi after a two after a year layoff is finally back in the NFL. A lot and, of people don't know that. And he says, we're going to put you back to your wide receiver, whatever position. Yeah. Um, and they go through preseason. Yeah. And he's just like, I don't have it. And I saw an interview with him yeah. later in life. He was just like, I didn't have, I wasn't a step. I wasn't even with the guys. I was a step behind. And it was one of those things where it was just like, I would be a hindrance to this team. And you see that sometimes with athletes who aren't like, you know, ring chasing or like stat chasing who have had great careers that they they just hang it up because they're like, I don't have anything left and I yep. don't have anything you to know, offer the in, team. Yeah. In yeah. my arsenal to help this team win games. So out of respect to that, they retire. Yep. And that's exactly what he did, which is unfortunate because I think that was like the first season in about 10 plus where they finished with an above 500 record, which shows you the crap that he had to probably put up with throughout his entire career. Well, that's that's something that you kind of lose a, a, along the way is how great he produced under possibly a bad system with the with the Redskins. So he retires but stays with the Redskins. Yes, he so. does. Um, I did want to bring this up, though. Okay, yeah, because he has some stats that... Yeah, these are important to illustrate what a Swiss Army knife this dude is, or what was. Uh, 593 catches, 6,492 yards, 49 touchdowns. Uh, nine, or, uh, oh, these are his Redskins stats. I'm sorry. When he retired, he had 14... Or he had, yeah, 14, 000, over 14,000 yards... Second in NFL history at the time. Yeah, so when he retired, For total he was, yards, kick, punt, rush, total accumu- accumulated yards. He was second. Ninety-one touchdowns. There are guys in the Hall of Fame who don't have that. No, not at all. Um, Seven thousand nine hundred fifty-four receiving yards because this includes his Cleveland stats, and then two thousand seven hundred thirty-five rushing yards. Yep, the guy had over ten thousand yards from scrimmage. Amazing. No, he, amazing. He, and he didn't get even get into the Hall of Fame until like 10 years after he was eligible. That was something else that people were talking about. This was back when, and Jim Brown said it. He said if he was a white player, unfortunately, because of the yeah. era, he would have been a, a first ballot Hall of Famer, and people would be talking about him like he was, you know. He's almost lo- like it's like when he goes to Washington, the team's so bad that he's like lost to history yeah which is a goddamn shame no it's ridiculous especially with his stats retiring second in total yards when you retire it, it, it's something that really because he changed i feel like he changed the way a lot of this like the flanker is essentially no he took a position that was at a certain level and just raised the bar is basically what he did he Be- said this is the gold standard now because he was making i mean he was like first in catches multiple years and, oh, yeah. and making the pro bowl and that's that's the thing that i have to agree with jim brown is the the racism that i i feel like followed him even in t- past his career which so. is fucking ridiculous because he never asked for any of it no like, that was the other thing he was just like i just want to play and you see he was a just a good man so many of these guys are just like i didn't want this thrust upon me i just want to play and he said later in life he was happy that it happened but like during it he was just like i just want to play God could damn. you imagine a lesser man they would have quit no, they would have yeah. like they're no like, no i'm not up. going to the redskins fuck this trade yeah st- seriously mean, though granted that was when players were indentured servants and like you had to go but like you know no no trade clauses and things but thomas boswell the washington post had a great quote about him he said a four-way threat 
running the ball from the backfield, catching passes as a wide receiver, and returning kickoffs and punts. It's unique. No player has been among the very best in all four areas. Mitchell is a group photo of one. That's awesome. And it's almost like because he was so versatile yet so dominant, nobody focuses in like a on a Jim Brown or like a Walter Payton where they're like specifically running backs, you know? It's almost like he's lost and all his account. I shouldn't say he's lost, but he's almost overlooked. Overlooked, I would say. I mean, you see Washington hasn't even retired his number. They just did. They just Last did? Last year. Okay. Yes. Okay. They finally, he's alongside Sammy Baugh is the okay. only two retired numbers. And I want to get into, well, post-career and how much the, uh, the Redskins kind of screwed him over despite yeah. his years of service. So he goes to work as Was- in Washington as a scout and works he, his way up to assistant general manager. Well, immediately they said as a scout, he was identifying players like he, he knew football from top to bottom. And that's something that they say ex players can't necessarily do right away. Yeah. Identify other positions. But like he played so many positions that I feel like he was ready to just because they said he was like he was our, one of our best scouts right away. Well, and they won three Super Bowls yep. while he was assistant general That's, manager. And that was the thing was they promoted him to assistant general manager and they were doing great as a franchise. And he worked all the way up until 2003. So like right after he retires, he's working for Lombardi as a scout. So, I mean, that's 35 years worth of fucking service to a franchise. Well, let me say something that Lombardi says to him. He says, my end goal, when they were talking about him becoming a scout after he retires, he said, my end goal is is to either become the general manager or a head coach in the NFL. And to Lombardi's credit, he said, if you're good enough, you're not going to get overlooked for your race. Oh, no. (laughs) He came out with this quote that said, Vince Lombardi lied to me. And then he had to he had to be specific as to what he meant. He said he didn't mean it like Vince actually believed I was going to be a a GM or a head coach. He just didn't understand that the racism was going to go 40 years into, you know what I mean? He was figuring it was like ending. He's probably like thinking, oh, I encountered a ton of Italian racism when I'm coming up coaching. Yes, exactly. But they're not going to be doing this 40 years down the road. So Sorry, Vince. In 78, he gets overlooked for the uh, general manager position, which people were saying that he should have been that guy. He was yeah. like being groomed to to be the GM. And the Washington basically gets away with it because Bobby Beathard is a Hall of Fame general manager. Yep. And he's still, you know, this man just keeps taking it in stride. It's like terrible to watch. And then in, uh, what was it, I believe, the uh, 90s, he was passed over again for Charlie Casserly, Kassler, yeah. yeah, which is total fucking bullshit. Both times, he, if you would, and this is what they said, if you were asking people around the organization, they're like, "Bobby Mitchell is going to be the next GM." When and it just uh, didn't happen no. both times. And he said it was one of the biggest disappointments because always a he bridesmaid, thought, never a bride. He thought he was not only he thought he was going to be the first black GM. He thought he was going to be. Yeah. You know what I mean? There was all this stuff that he wanted to. do accomplish post career and he just i hate to say it but washington just fucked him over oh it's not like washington uh, you know well history of racism let's go with that (laughs) well and what i because i didn't realize that they actually retired his jersey and he said he got absolutely furious because they gave his number to one of the players yeah when steve spurrier came yes it's like you already had a shit show to begin with but like bobby bethard and bobby mitchell and you have a good front office then when daniel snyder buys the team it's like ooh, let's put some gasoline on this dumpster fire because he's a goddamn sexual harassing moron yeah, well, I mean, that's what uh, it's unfortunate. That's the, that's the thing for me was he should have had he should have been on a better team. But that's you'll never you can't pick your team. Yeah, you, you know can. what I You're mean? Basically, es- fuck, especially in this especially era, no free agency. Yep. Um, and I feel like he could have had a better post career, not for any fault of his own. Yeah, but he was Washington through and through, which I always yes. found so interesting. Like him and his wife, who was an attorney, had their two kids there and lived in the D.C. area, um, did a lot of things in the community, hosted the Hall of Fame Classic, which is a golf fundraiser for leukemia. I don't know if that's related to Ernie Davis or just because he's a decent guy. Yeah. You know, um, worked with so many different um, 
organizations, United Negro College Fund, Howard University Cancer Research Center, American Lung Association of DC. Like this guy was just Washington through and through despite all the crap that was shoveled in his face for uh, the, so long. The quote that I saw, they were like, do you want, what's the quote that would encompass your career? And he said, the struggle was worth it. Yeah. I thought that was pretty good because, I mean, he had to go through just so much shit, but... You have to be, like, one of the most positive people in the world. Exactly. You have to eat that many shit sandwiches and succeed and just let it all go. Like, that... And he's a Hall of Fame football player. Yes. Like, he took all of that struggle and funneled it into just becoming... The arguably one of the best players of the 1960s. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, you think of the 60s, you think of the Packers and Cowboys and things like that. But it's like, no, this guy was incredible. He was so good. Yeah. And then uh, just last year, uh, April 5th, 2020, uh, at 84, uh, he ended up dying. Yeah. Which uh, at least, uh, which is a goddamn shame because they ended up retiring his uh, jersey number maybe two months after. So yeah. we never got to see it happen. And one of the greatest players in the entirety of the Washington franchise. So, uh, Bobby Mitchell. Hey, everybody. This is just a stock message at the end of every episode. We hope you enjoyed whatever athlete and or team that that episode was about. Just want to say give us a quick follow on all social media. We have a YouTube channel, the Sports Experience Podcast. And we're on Instagram, Tolo Dominic and myself, C. Quinn Comedy. So give us a follow all around. Um, we're always recording right here at Angle Studio. Thank you all very much.